All right, my friends, welcome to the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel, where we take a simple and fundamental approach to fitness to give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that sponsor these episodes like Micro Workouts, Grind Style Calisthenics, and I've got several more coming out, which I'll be discussing later on in today's episode that I'm really excited about as well. But uh, links to the full RDP library are down below in the description. You can buy them on Amazon and Kindle and paperback, as well as PDFs on the RDP merch uh, page as well. So today's topic is continuing off of last week's episode, which was aptly titled, How to Make a Workout Routine That Doesn't Suck. Because getting in shape and having a good workout routine is essential for your goals. But you don't need to make it like rocket science to make it effective. A lot of people way overthink their workout routines and apply way too many like, okay, what if I'm like facing Northwest during the first half of the year and what do I work out on the winter solstice and what do I work out if I'm a beginner versus if I've been working out for two months? All these questions, most of them don't mean anything whatsoever. Instead, we want to be basing our workouts off of our objectives, off of your preferences, and your resources on what you can do. And basically anything that helps you steer in that direction is going to be going in the right direction. Hey, Leo, good to see you here. Thanks for coming on. Big Smoke coming on as well. Thank you very much, folks. But I know I left a big part of that workout or the the thing out, which is, okay, so I'm using the tools I like, I'm doing the exercises I like, I got a schedule that works uh, with my routine and my lifestyle and everything like that. But you didn't tell us anything about how to actually program the actual exercises to get what we want with our objectives. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, because I'm going to be sharing with you a model that I created that basically way oversimplifies things. Well, maybe not oversimplifies it, but makes things a hell of a lot easier. How many sets, how many reps, how many blah, 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 right? You go on Google and you're like, how should I do pushups to build muscle and strength? How should I do uh, workouts in this way? And this is gonna make it all real simple and also able to be customized to you because any sort of advice of do this many sets, do this many reps and stuff is cookie cutter advice or uh, fortune cookie advice, what I like to say. It's basically uh, I general ideas and guidelines that people are spitting out into the universe or the, uh, the World Wide Web. But for the most part, they're general estimated guesses about what you know. Nobody can possibly know specifically what you need without especially one-on-one interaction. So that's why it's important to understand that everything's kind of malleable. Everything's kind of a general guesstimation and it's up to you to really dial things in for your best possible result. So when it comes down to our workouts and our training and stuff, it all boils down to not the exercises you do, not the workout programs, not even the tools you use. I was just on uh, with uh, Danny Cavadlo. He's got a brand new book coming out called Hybrid Strength, and it's all about combining free weights to calisthenics training. And one of the biggest m- messages from that conversation was that it's not about free weights versus body weight training. It actually doesn't really matter. And I say this a lot in a lot of the things I do when people are like, should I lift kettlebells? Should I do this? Should I do that? To a large degree, it really doesn't matter what kind of exercises you're doing. It really doesn't matter what tools you're using. It really doesn't even matter to some degree what routine you're following. Instead, we want to get down to the fundamental level of what makes exercise work. And what makes exercise work is the use and manipulation of muscle tension. It's not coming from the exercise or the what tool you use. Like, dude, what about bench press on barbell versus dumbbell? Dude, to be honest with you, I couldn't possibly care less. It really doesn't matter. What does matter is how much tension is in your muscles. And we want to be mindful of that. Now, this model is based off of a different model from the world of photography. Because fundamentally, photography is all about light. And you take light in through the lens of the camera, and you're manipulating and using that light to different ways to get the image that you want. And in photography, they have what they call the exposure triangle, three things to be mindful of that are manipulating light. The first thing is your ISO, or the light sensitivity of the sensor. 
your shutter speeds, so how long the sensor is exposed to the light, and aperture, or in other words, how big is the hole that the light is going through towards the sensor. And you can manipulate all three of those to basically adjust how much light is getting to the sensor and the exposure to it. Now that's a th the exposure triangle. We want to have the exact same kind of approach with exercise because it, when you've got a camera and you got it set up, it doesn't matter if you're taking a picture of a deer or a building, the exposure triangle works. Or if you're like, what if I'm taking a picture at night versus taking it at, at dawn or something? It's like, doesn't matter. Use the exposure triangle to manipulate ISO, shutter speed, and your aperture to get the right image. Same exact thing with exercise, all right? I don't care who you are, what your objectives are and stuff. All you gotta do is understand these three things and manipulate them accordingly to get what you want out of your training. And if you don't know how to manipulate these things, you're basically just randomly guessing about what you should be doing in the workout. And one of the most fatal mistakes we often make is assuming that just because the workout is hard, that it's going to be effective, which, I wish I knew years ago, but that's far from the case. There are plenty of ways you can have a very hard workout and actually go in completely opposite direction from your objectives. You could be actually running away from your goals. So here's how the tension triangle works. On the base, you have the scale between tension and time. And one end you have tension, where you have the other side you have time. Now tension is the amount of contractile force in the actual muscle. That is like, you know, squeeze your fist and squeeze it tar harder. Okay, you now have more tension in your muscles than before. It's just making the muscle contract harder. Again, doesn't matter what the exercise is, doesn't matter what tools you're using and stuff, more tension in the muscle is more tension in the muscle. That's uh, oftentimes associated with strength in the world. And in the clinical sense, when someone talks about getting stronger, what they're talking about is there's physically more tension in the muscle. Okay, so that's tension, that's on one side. On the other side, you have time, and that's measured in many other different ways. That's oftentimes referred to as repetitions, number of sets, okay? Uh, for isometrics, it's associated with just straight out time, okay? So it's uh, how long can you do something for? Uh, so that is the duration of that tension. Now, of course, anyone who's trained for a good amount of time understands that these two things are in a kind of seesaw relationship to one another. If you have a lot of tension, you can't hold it for very long periods of time, like one rep max, like tons of tension, but you can't do it for very long. But on the other hand, if you could do a lot of something, you can't do that with a whole lot of tension and vice versa. And so this is one of the most fundamental ideas that we wanna understand about everything in exercise is getting honest with yourself and basically like, do you want to focus more on producing a good amount of tension in the muscle or doing something for a good period of time or somewhere between the two? And that's very, very important because doing a million repetitions with light repetition, with light tension is not gonna be the same as doing uh, fewer repetitions with less time. Now, you're both gonna make your muscle tired they're both going to feel hard, but they're fundamentally stimulating different change in adaptation in your muscles. They're telling your muscles how to change in different ways. Lots of times you see this based on like strength versus endurance is one of the more common ways of going about it. So that's the first thing to recognize is, do you want more strength? Do you want more endurance? Do you want more tension or do you want to do something for a longer period of time? Again, neither is wrong. Neither one is the thing that's not something you should be going for is basically just what's more important to you. And don't feel like, well, I'm sure I'll be able to contract my muscles super hard to lift 500 pounds if I do a million pushups a day. No, that's like saying you'll be a really good 100 meter sprinter if you run marathons. You're fundamentally training your body in the opposite direction you want to go in. So don't be surprised that you do something in one way, chasing after one end of that spectrum and then you get called on to do something on the other end and you're not very good at it. Will you be better than if you did nothing? Absolutely, but will you be as good as you could be? Not even close. So that's why we wanna be honest with ourselves about what do you want? And you'll always come across people in fitness who will personally feel like one is more important than the other and criticize people for going on the other end. 
Like if you're more of an endurance guy, they'll be like, yeah, but strength is the one and only thing that we should be focusing on. And if you can't um, do a one rep max and so forth, then what's the point? But you also have other people like, well, you can lift 500 pounds two times, but if you can't, you know, carry something for six miles, like you're doing rucks uh, work in the army or something, then what's the point there? And that's the question we always want to ask ourselves. What's the point? And the point should be because this is the objective that I'm trying to train my body to do. And if you're going towards the opposite, not only are you wasting your time going the other direction, you're compromising and you're hurting the results you do want. So the more you go for endurance, the more you're going to hurt your ability to generate a lot of strength. Or the more you go after that strength, the more you're going to hurt your endurance. So it's not just about which one's important, but making sure you're not going in the direction that is hurting the very results you want. So that's the base of the triangle and pretty much most of what we want to be focusing on. And Alex uh, asks here, well, which one is better for muscular tension uh, in general, high rep, lightweight, or low rep, high rate uh, progression? Neither of them, just greasing the groove for example. So this is a very good uh, position that Alex has. So basically, when we want to be able to generate tension and, and a good amount of muscle tension, strength is the way to go. That's that's literally what you're trying to do is generate more strength. And so that's where isometrics are very handy. That's where a lot of like uh, the conjugate method with uh, West Side Barbell comes into play. There's something there that's like, how much tension can you generate in the muscle? That's the point. It's not how long can you do it, because if you're more on the endurance side, you're not training your muscle to hold more tension. You're not actually making yourself more strong. You're actually just saying, do the same thing many, many, many times. However, one of the big mistakes that is often made is that endurance, though, does tend to promote a uh, more efficient ability, okay? So if you are doing something very heavy, and you're not doing it very much because you're going very heavy, right? It's very hard to practice and become proficient at it so you can just do it automatically. In the martial arts, you know, we have this tendency where we'll just do things with very high reps because we'll drill that sidekick a thousand times. We're not going to build a stronger sidekick with that. There's no way because the first sidekick we do and the thousand sidekick we do take the same amount of tension. Therefore, the ability to generate and create more tension never progresses. So you, there's no way you can get stronger. However, the efficiency of the nervous system means that you're doing some neural pruning. So the amount of effort and energy it takes to throw that sidekick goes down. Remember, we're always fundamentally seeking a more efficient path. So after doing a thousand gazillion bajillion sidekicks over 10 years, and suddenly you got to throw a sidekick, bang, and it just goes and it's like effortless. And the easiest thing for you to do, are you stronger? No, you're not stronger because the amount of tension in the muscles is still roughly the same, but there's so much less friction and stiffness and neural, and neural uh, holdback during the sidekick that the strength you do have is much more potent because there's just less holding you back. And that's why you're faster. That's why you can generate more power. That's why you can be better at the exercise. The muscle isn't stronger, but you're better at the exercise. So this is why I always say there's a difference between the muscle being stronger and the movement being stronger. So you can have a very strong sidekick, but your muscles aren't necessarily all that strong. I experienced this a lot in the biking field. Like there are tons of mountain bikers out there that break my legs every time we ride. We go up the steepest pitches and they're on single speeds. They don't even have gears and they're just riding up it like it's nothing. And it's like, oh my God, these guys are so strong. That's insane. But then you get them into the gym and they're struggling to leg press 245s. And it's like, I don't get it, dude. Like just this weekend, we were riding and you were riding as if your legs were stronger than a power lifter. But we come in here and you're barely stronger than a 13-year-old girl. It's like, why? Because they've ridden their bikes so much and they've become so neurologically efficient at that pedaling motion that it is literally easier for their muscles to pedal that bike. That's what's happened. They're not stronger. They're more efficient. But it seems like they're more stronger. So that's something we want to watch out for that can fool us into thinking that we're stronger when we're really not. But at the end of the day, it again, it boils down to what do you want to do? 
like if I want to ride my mountain bike and I want to ride it as long and hard and fast as possible, then yes, efficiency is extremely important. Definitely strength is good and stuff like that, but you could have all the strength in the world, but if your efficiency is terrible and you're out of practice, you're still going to suck as a mountain biker. Like, I don't care if you can back squat 800 pounds, I'm going to kick your ass in a race. There's just no way because you're going to maybe keep up with me for the first hundred yards and then you're just going to gas out and, and bail off because you don't have the efficiency. So that's another way we can kind of look at it, is strength versus efficiency, which one is important for you and your objectives. That's a awesome, awesome uh question here. Let's uh, get to another one here before we fill in the rest of this triangle. Chilled Happy Doggo. I love that <laughs> avatar, the doggy with the babushka. Uh, I've been stuck on eight reps of pull-ups for like two months now before I had quite a fast progress from two to eight in about three months. Yep. And I feel like I'm going in cycles every workout. Um, yeah, that's always what happens. Like this is one of the things that uh, I should do a podcast on is like so many, uh, so much of our rhetoric about how we think fitness is supposed to work isn't based on truth. It's based on marketing. Like there are a lot of people trying to sell you things are like, this is how you're supposed to experience results and stuff. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to make good progress and then hit a wall and you're probably going to spend the next year trying to get that last two. Same thing with weight loss. Every time people come up to me, like I was on this diet and I lost a good amount of weight and then I started to slow down and now I'm in a plateau. What did I do wrong? Nothing. That's always what happens. That's always what happens. If someone came up to me and they're like, I was on this diet, I lost two and a half pounds every week for three straight years and now I'm at my goal weight. I'd be like, holy Jesus, jump in Jehoshaphat. What are you, a time traveler? Like that never happens. It never happens, but we think it's supposed to happen because that's what the marketing is always telling us is supposed to be happening. So yes, exactly. Welcome to the land of reality. This is where the real strength starts to come in. And breaking repetition plateaus, I always tell people the same thing. The reason why you're stuck at eight is because your eight uh, repetitions isn't good enough. You will need to improve how well you're doing those eight, and then you'll get nine and 10 and stuff. So look at things like range of motion, tension control. For pull-ups especially, keeping your shoulders back, a lot of shoulder instability holds people back when it comes to upper body excellence. Uh, Greg uh, Furman. Greg, it's so good to see you again, my friend. Uh, kettlebell swings lend themselves well to the efficiency style of training. Absolutely, which is why they're so awesome for that power and explosiveness and athleticism and stuff. Interesting how some exercises lend themselves to one side of the spectrum in some applications. For sure, for sure. So in kettlebell training, they've got that 10,000 swing challenge, right? And that's why it's like going more towards that sort of thing. Because if you can be so efficient with using their hips, which most people are horribly efficient at using their hips, if they can even use them at all, then the next time you, when you need to use your hips for running, for jumping, for kicking, for skiing, for all those sorts of things, it happens on autopilot. And that's why, like, I will take someone who can do a thousand kettlebell swings in a weekend over someone who can deadlift 500 pounds because you could deadlift 500 pounds when the stars align and you're like, okay, good, but there's a lot in the back and there's a lot here, but how good are you at using your hips? Probably pretty good, but how good can you do that on a regular basis? Someone who can easily crank out a thousand reps and they're like, dude, this 53 pound kettlebell feels like it weighs nothing guess what that's going to do to everything they're using their hips for? And it's going to be really, really powerful and potent. Uh, so <clears throat> another question here, Phantom MC, is it okay to change my reps every one to two months? Because example, I want to develop strength this month, then next month I want to develop endurance, can't want to focus on one thing and be unbalanced. So this is a very good question. And it's absolutely true. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they go to one side of that spectrum and they sit there and they never move. Now, it's very good and very common to emphasize one side or the other, for sure. Absolutely. Like for the most part, I like to emphasize more on that high end sort of thing. That's why when People ask me, how many push-ups can, can I do? The answer is hopefully not very many <laughs> because if I'm able to crank out 50 repetitions, I know I'm doing a push-up that's too easy, right? I want it to be hard. And usually, especially these days, like I like to sit around that five or six rep range, like make it really, really hard to do super low repetitions, super high intensity because I know I'm at that more strength end of the spectrum. So, but yeah, we want to change things up, especially, and as we'll get into a little bit, when it comes to building muscle, because I know that's a big thing that a lot of people ask. They're like, so which one's more important, like tension or endurance? Well, here's, here's how you want to think about it. 
are you going to build more muscle if you can lift 100 pounds once or 10 pounds 100 times? The answer is neither. Neither are going to make you build muscle because the reason why we send a stimulus to build muscle, and this is just the exercise thing. You could have a perfect exercise program, still not build an ounce because your diet sucks, your sleep sucks, your stress recovery sucks, your genetics suck, 100 other things. But when it comes to stimulating that muscle growth, we don't want to go heavy. We don't want to go light. We want to go more. Okay, so that 100 pounds once won't build muscle. But if you go, well, I was lifting it once, but now I'm going to lift it twice. There you go. Well, I was lifting that 10 pounder 100 times, but now I'm going to lift it 110 times. Now, here we go. But usually people have a lot of trouble engaging and, um, excuse me, progressing the work capacity of the muscle at the ends of the spectrum. So that's why most people are usually better off more in the middle of the spectrum where it's like, okay, I do strength work, but it's more like eight repetitions. And then for endurance work, it's more like 15 to 20 repetitions. It's not, you know, huge, like a hundred reps of pushups or one to two kind of thing. It's usually still somewhere in the middle because we want to uh, progress, not the strength, not the endurance, both, which is your muscular work capacity. That's what we want to stimulate that hypertrophy, at least give you the best chance of doing that sort of thing. Uh, very good. So when we are doing, so Leo's asking about uh, the, the old man push-ups. So 10 old man push-ups, it takes five minutes, right, Leo? So we're more on the endurance side of things because if you can do a strength exercise for 10 minutes or five minutes or hell, even one minute, that's pretty light. It's really grinding out the muscle and you're working the work capacity to a very high degree, but any, you know, what's the old power lifting uh, state, uh, idea? You know, some power lifter one time I was working out and he's like, anything over three reps is cardio, you know, kind of thing. I was like, what? But I'm going heavy. It's like, that's not heavy. You can only, you're doing six reps. Heavy is three reps or less. That was his attitude. But again, it's all down to time. If you can do it for a good amount of time, you don't have a lot of tension, relatively speaking. I mean, you could have someone who's out there like, dude, this guy on the NFL combine bench press 225, 50 reps. That's a lot of tension. It is a lot of tension, but it's not a lot of tension relative to what they could do. They could probably bench press like 500 or something. It's all relative to you. What's relative to you? What's relative to a lot of tension versus a lot of time? So for some people, one pull-up is all they can do. So that's high tension, low time. But other people are like, I can do 50 pull-ups, okay? That's low tension, a lot of time relative to them, even though it's seemingly on paper about the same thing, but it's much more on the endurance side of things. All right, so anyway, we've got a triangle here though. Like don't get too caught up in just the time, uh, the tension versus time uh, conundrum because that's not the whole story. We still have a third element because what we're talking about here is the amount of time you're doing the exercise. And you're doing it with a given amount of tension in the muscle relative, that's relative to, uh, to uh, resistance. Remember, resistance doesn't, can create tension in your muscles. You have a heavy weight in your hand. That weight doesn't tell your muscles to turn on. It'd be great if it did. It'd make my job a hell of a lot easier, but your muscles turn on because your brain tells them to turn on. Resistance doesn't make your muscles work hard. Resistance just necessitates hard work. It just says, okay, you have to create a certain amount of tension in order to lift this weight or do these, this pull up or whatever, right? So that's what we want to also pay attention to is resistance and tension, not the same thing. And it's very easy to get them confused. Hell, it's even easy to get confused between weight and resistance. So if someone lifts a heavier weight, it's easy to just jump that logic train or jump to conclusions and say, well, the muscles are stronger, right? Maybe, maybe not. That's the thing that I used to mistakenly do. It's like, as long as I got more weight moving through space, I'm stronger. Uh, looking back now, like, no, you're not, Matt. You're not stronger. You're not building strength. You're building compensation because your technique, frankly, sucks. Um, so that's the thing is we want to recognize we have weight, we have resistance, and we have muscle tension. All three of them are very heavily correlated. Absolutely. But they're not the same thing because weight is just the weight of something. But it's not resistance. You can have the same weight but have different resistance because resistance is influenced by weight, but it's also influenced by technique. And it's also influenced to just angle of movement to gravity. Like you put 245s on a barbell and squat it, that's going straight up and down. 
that's a certain amount of resistance on your legs. But you get on a leg press that's at a 45 degree angle, same weight on the plate on the, the sled, you're not creating the same amount of resistance because it's not going straight up against gravity. It's at a 45 degree angle. Same thing like if you had a dumbbell, you know, lifting it straight out here, that's a certain amount of resistance. If I bend my arm, I decrease the resistance. The weight in my hand could be the same thing. So it's not always the same. Weight and resistance, not always exactly the same thing. Then you also have tension. And that's what's always the most important is we want to focus on the tension in the actual muscle. We want to be able to generate that tension because a lot of times we don't have a very good ability to generate tension in the muscles sometimes. But we'll still, if our brain is still thinking, well, the weight's got to lift, then we can have all sorts of compensation techniques, you know, and we're using other muscles to get the job done and stuff like that. So if our brain is thinking the weight is moving through space, weight equals resistance, resistance equals muscle tension, then we're essentially fooling ourselves, which is exactly what I did uh, for far, far too long. All right. So uh, Leo's asking, uh, making a very good point. He's talking about has gone from 25 push-ups in five to over 100 five minutes every hour practice. Practice. So yeah, you're building efficiency there, Leo. You're getting good at doing push-ups. You're becoming more efficient at it. And that's good. That's great if you want to be efficient and very powerful at push-ups. But you're not getting stronger. You're getting stronger at push-ups, but you're not getting stronger in the actual muscle to a certain degree. Because when we are doing an exercise, it requires a given amount of tension. And the more we practice it, the more we can generate that tension, which is good. The more we reinforce that tension, which is good. All this is good. But there's not any more tension. We only make a stronger muscle when it says, okay, you actually have to produce more tension, not more, the same amount of tension more times. And it's all that balancing act. So anyway, uh, the other part of the triangle, right up to the top, the base of which tension and time, but we also want to be looking at the time not doing the exercise. So think in musical theory, right? If you just didn't have any spaces between notes, it just sound like a jumbled, garbled mess. The spaces between the notes are what are responsible for helping the pace and the rhythm and the, the basically making the music what it is, is the spaces in between. So this largely, especially during the actual workout, <coughs> excuse me, is of course the rest periods, the amount of time you're taking between your sets between your exercises that you're doing. And this is the third variable in the triangle that we want to manipulate. So here's what you want to be looking for is what is the kind of the rest periods in between that allow you to work that tension and time respective of your goals. Now, if you're an athlete and you're like, I need to be able to go with minimal rest, like say NFL linemen, for example, you have short rest periods and you've got to go 100% every single time, then you want to be training with relatively short rest periods in order to maximize the stamina of that. Stamina is what we're going for. It's not endurance. Endurance is how much you can do something. Strength is how hard. Endurance is how much. Okay. If you're doing more of it, you're building endurance. If you're doing it harder, you're building strength. If you're doing them relative to time taken off, you're building stamina. And that can come into play depending on your athleticism. And there's pros and cons as always to both. So having shorter rest periods, and again, it's relative, like resting three minutes in between squats could push your stamina. Resting 90 seconds could push it. Resting 90 seconds could decrease it. It all depends on what your current stamina is. Back when I was a mountain bike racer, right? I'd need a given amount of strength to get up a hill. But at the top of the hill, I couldn't stop and just rest. I couldn't be like, okay, I'm going to, hold on, let me catch my breath here for a while. So if you get to the top of the hill, you get maybe two breaths and you got to go back on it again. Like I'd usually give myself three pedal rotations at a light cadence to just kind of uh, give myself a deep breath at the top of the hill. And you got to go like you can't rest you. It's a hundred percent every pedal stroke every single time. So that's one of the things that I had to get really good at was improving not just my endurance of can I ride with a good amount of intensity up this hill, but can I improve my stamina? So I go up the hill, I go flat for a little bit, and then bang, you go up a hill again. No rest. You just keep going and going. So in that case, it's important. But again, it depends on what's important to you, though. 
what is important. Like if that's not important to you, don't worry about it. Cause you'll hear a lot of people say, it's like, well, yeah, if you're pushing that stamina, but the more you push your stamina, the more you're compromising your ability to have that tension and for a good amount of time. So this is why a lot of times people will say, if you want to build strength, you need a long rest period. Because if you do a very heavy exercise and you only give yourself like 30 seconds to rest, the next time you jump to that exercise, you're just not gonna have the energy to generate that much muscle tension. So your ability to generate a good amount of tension is compromised. That's great if you need to train your stamina. If you don't need to train your stamina, don't compromise it. That doesn't need to be there. Same thing with endurance. Let's say you're doing a, a push-up contest, right? And you're doing push-ups and you're like, okay, I did 20, but the clock is ticking. I got to do like 50 in a minute or five, five minutes or whatever the case may be. Then you need good stamina for that. You've got to push it. But if your goal is I want to do 50 push-ups to the very best of my ability, then don't push the stamina. <laughs> this Trying to push the stamina is just going to compromise your ability to do more reps every single time. So all three of these are part of every single thing you ever do. It's not like you're going to exclude either, just like in the exposure triangle, you can exclude shutter or aperture or ISO. All three are always in play for every image you take. All exercises you do, no matter what, are gonna be a mixture of endurance, strength, and stamina. The question is, which ones are you emphasizing or do you want to emphasize? And making sure that your programming isn't emphasizing the things that aren't important to you. Because the more you emphasize ones that aren't important, the more you're compromising the things that are. The more you push endurance, the more you compromise your strength. The more you compromise your strength, the more you compromise your endurance. The more you compromise, compromise your stamina, the more you're compromising either of them. So it's all about what is important to you and programming your workouts accordingly. That way you have the control to say, okay, I'm you know, really interested in more of the ability to do uh, endurance work. I'm a mountain biker and I need stamina. Okay, so in that case, you're gonna be training on the left side of that triangle. You're gonna be doing higher repetition style strength stuff, power explosiveness, think those kettlebell swings, and stamina is gonna be imp important as well. So I think maybe Tabata kettlebell swings would be a good approach to that, right? You've got four minutes, eight rounds, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, go. So that would be more of that endurance stamina side of things. Or you could be like that NFL lineman I was talking about. I need strength, I need a lot of strength, and I need a lot of power to push away around uh, members of the other team, but I also need some stamina. So you're on now on the right side of that triangle where it's like, I need strength, but I also need stamina. So in that case, <coughs> excuse me, you might do something like every minute on the minute style training, where you'd have a heavy exercise, like a weighted pull up or a weight sled or deadlift or cleans or something. And it's like, okay, every minute on the minute, really heavy, four repetitions every minute on the minute. So you would do like power cleans or something, four of them, like really hard. And then you'd have the rest of the minute to recover and then beep, the minute goes off and you got to go again. So that would be strength, stamina sort of things, right? And then when it comes down to building muscular, uh, 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 your muscles up hypertrophy, you're on the bottom part of that triangle. You want to be going for both a little strength and a little bit of endurance. But if you're pushing your stamina a lot, your ability to generate tension and for a good amount of time is now going to be compromised. So you're now on the bottom part of that triangle for that sort of thing. And you're gonna be manipulating back and forth between maybe a little more on the endurance side, maybe a little more on the strength side. And you can do that any way you want. You could do it every other week, every other month. You could do it in the same workout, like with grind style calisthenics, but those are the areas of the triangle you wanna inhibit the most. So that's the, the power of the uh, tension triangle is giving you the ability to focus on what is important to you and not go for the things that aren't because it is something that is not only about going after what you want, but ensuring you're not doing workout programming that's compromising your results. Let's ask Alex said once again, if you could do 20 pull-ups, it does not mean that you can do one arm chin up. Yeah, very true. But if you can do one arm chin up, you can, uh, you definitely can do 20 pull-ups. Don't be so sure on that one uh, there, Alex, because it's not always a direct correlation. There is always a correlation, absolutely. Excuse me, I got a hair on my lens there, uh, a direct correlation between some stamina and some strength. 
you know, and there are some people who, you know, they're like short distance sprinters, 200 meter sprinters, and they can run a 10 K on a whim. Right. But there's only so far that band can stretch. Okay. So I've known, uh, you know, I knew a power lifter and very, very strength based, always weighted chins, weighted pulls, weighted pulls, weighted pulls, do pull-ups with hundred pounds, 120 pounds kind of thing, but ask him to do more than 10. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it because again, there's that efficiency side of things. There's that stamina. There's a lot of systems at play here. It's not just the muscle fibers. It's also just the nervous system. It's the, even just the mental emotionally kind of thing. When uh, we are doing our repetitions, we get in the habit of stopping at a certain point. This is one of the things we were talking about earlier with the eight repetitions, um, kind of being a plateau. A lot of times plateaus are due to just habitual stuff where you keep doing eight reps, you keep doing eight reps and you reinforce that eight rep limitation. And that's why sometimes when people are like, I can't break a plateau, one of the recommendations you'll come across sometimes is stop counting your reps because mentally and emotionally, we feel fatigued. We make ourselves tired. We convince ourselves through a psychosomatic effect of, well, uh, seven repetitions, that's probably about all I can do because we keep telling ourselves every workout, that's all I can do. But when you stop counting and you just keep blitzing through it, you know, you're just like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Suddenly you don't have that habitual stopping point. I've seen this time and time and time again where people have limited themselves and it's, um, it's, it's a self-imposed limitation. I was training a guy one time and he started doing dips and he got about five or six in. And he was like, well, how many uh, do you want me to do? We were kind of just in the warm-up phrase stages of things. I was like, uh, hit me 12, 12 reps. And bang, he immediately jumped off the dip bars. He's like, what are you, crazy? 12 repetitions? He's like, dude, I'm 52. I'm like, so? I don't care. It's like, why are you giving me 12 repetitions? How do you think I could do 12 repetitions? I can't do 12 repetitions. This is crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm giving you 12 reps because you got 10 last week and you said it was easy. You know, so 12 shouldn't be much of a stretch. But the second that number 12 entered his brain, he shut down. Every His brain was like, time out, hold on, everything turn off. End of discussion. But then the next week I played a trick on him. Because I was like, okay, three minute test, dips. And he's like, how many should I do? I'm like, I don't care. You got three minutes, just do what he did. He cranked out 17 in his first go. Cause he wasn't counting. I was counting like silently, one, two, three, four, five. You know, and he got 17. And I was like, dude, you gave me guff last week because you couldn't, thought you couldn't do 12. You just did 17, you know? And it was just this little reframing of like, a lot of times our limitations are self-imposed. They're not based on reality. They're based on what we feel our limitations are. And that's one of the things we have to recognize about our ability to train ourselves adequately is most of the time we're limited by our feelings of the exercise, not what we can actually do. And part of my job sometimes as a trainer is getting people to feel differently about what they can do. So once that client did the 17, he's like, do you think I could get 20? I'm like, oh, hell yes, you can get 20. Like 20 is no problem for you. And so he got 20 because I flipped how he felt about it. Most of the time, it's how we feel that's going to be the thing that is holding us back. So Kilobyte 101, to progress to harder progressions on exercise, like push-up variations, for example, would you recommend weighted regressions or will regressions with just body weight suffice. So I'm kind of confused on this one because so actually bring up a couple of good points here. Um, weighted regressions. <laughs> I think it's two steps forward, two steps back in that regard. So refer to my table of progressive elements in body weight in a smart body weight training, a uh, second book that I ever wrote. So when we're working with our exercises, particularly calisthenics, remember that resistance thing I was telling you about? That resistance aspect is influenced by a number of technical things. Weight is one of them, just one of nine, okay? One of nine. Um, there's other things uh, that uh, range of motion is another, weight distribution is another, angle to gravity is another, yada, yada. So if you regress the technique, but you add weight, you're making it easier in one way while making it harder in another. <laughs> I was um, 
at the gym one time, this is kind of a funny story. And uh, one of my fellow trainers is kind of a bit of a gossip and a blowhard, but he's like, dude, dude, come here. You got to check this out. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And he's like, what? And he's like, this, you got to see this. This is totally stupid. This person had no idea what they're doing. And so what this person was doing was they were using a band for pull-ups, you know, the band that assists you going up, but they were also wearing a weight vest while they were doing that. So the band was pulling them up and the weight vest was pushing them down. So basically the two things were kind of canceling each other out. And, you know, we kind of had a laugh like, yeah, it's kind of stupid. But then I thought, but we all do that. We're, everybody does that. That's not different. Like I'm doing weighted pull-ups like this. I'm like, well, that's not hard, easier. It's like, I'm only, but I'm using both arms kind of thing, right? We all are progressive in one way and regressive in another way, right? We're all taking one step forward, one step back in some way, shape or form. And just because you're progressing in one way doesn't mean you're actually progressing if you're regressing in other ways, because that's not building strength, that's building, um, a compromise. You're compromising uh, compensation. That's the word I'm looking for. You're building compensation, not strength. So we want to be mindful of what we're able to progress. So anyway, back to the question to answer, answer it, to progress to harder progressions on an exercise. Now with calisthenics, this is kind of a funky question because in order to progress to a harder variation, like a step in combat conditioning, you need more than just strength. You, you, you can have strength there, but you still can't do, you know, a, a one-arm push-up because it also requires stability, it requires mobility, coordination, a host of other things, right? So that's a so when we're trying to progress, we want to also look at well, what do I need to progress? What's the thing holding you back? Fifteen people could be in front of me saying they want to go from knee push-ups to toe push-ups, and I could give every one of them different things to work on. Like you need to do more reps, you need to do less reps. You needed to use more range of motion. You need to use slightly less range of motion. You need to quit your back from sagging. You need to lift up your hips. You know, everybody can have a different thing that they need to get to the next step in a progressive calisthenics. So it's really hard to answer like, what do I need to do to progress? I'm like, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing now and depends on what that weak link is. But to get to a simple answer here, um, anything that is going to progress you will give you that chance. So let's say you regressed your push-up, right? You were doing close push-ups, but you did weighted push-ups, but you were wider, right? So you're regressing this way, but you're progressing with the weight. But you find by doing that, you can make your muscles work harder, AKA you have more tension in your muscles. Will that help you get to a harder progression? Absolutely. More strength is definitely gonna help you. But if you're compromising shoulder stability and you're hunching up like that, is that gonna help you? No, that's taking you away from it. So you might progress, but at the same time, you might not. It depends on what you're progressing, what sort of ingredients uh, you are uh, working on. <clears throat> Mariano, hey Matt, I feel that the bridges do not work the entire back of my body, but I do feel a lot when I do exercises like Superman arching uh, my lower back well. Uh, why can that happen? Very good question. So one of the big things about bridging that people mistakenly do is they try to push too much uh, with... Uh, with, with that. Uh, they think it's a pushing exercise. Bridges are supposed to be a pulling exercise. Now, this is a really good opportunity for you, Mariano, because when you're doing the Supermans, it's almost impossible to do that pushing because you're not really pushing against the floor. Maybe your feet are against something uh, like a stall bar or something, or you're just picking yourself up. So that motion of the Superman is almost impossible to do pushing. So that's all pulling. You're pulling your back together, your extension, right? So your mission now is to get that pulling motion to carry over to the bridges. And this is always a good thing to do whenever you notice like, okay, I do this exercise and I feel it this way, but I do this other exercise and I don't feel it that way. What Now we blame the exercise oftentimes because like, I'm grabbing it a different way or because I'm using a different tool or a different technique. No, the biggest objective that we can have when we're doing fundamentally based movement patterns is to make them all feel relatively the same, not different. You know, people are like, no, 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 lunge is totally different for the legs than squats. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be. You get down into a lunge, your front leg should feel exactly like you're squatting. If it's radically different, you're doing something wrong. You're doing some, well, maybe just different. You're engaging the muscles differently. You're applying 
force against the ground differently. Something you're doing is different. It's not the exercise. If the movement patterns were up the same, so in this case, Superman is extension, bridges are extension, they should be very close to the same. They may not always be exactly the same. You're changing the flavor a little bit. But if you're baking chocolate chip cookies, and then the next day you build or you uh, you bake cacao cookies, and it's like, oh my gosh, this one's sweet and that one's sour. Something went wrong with the recipe. <laughs> you did something wrong because they should be pretty much the same thing. They're both cookies kind of thing. So that's what we want with our exercises. If the movement pattern is roughly the same, the sensation and the stimulus should be roughly the same. And if they're not, that's a good chance for you to investigate and be like, all right, what am I doing different? How am I changing something around? And uh, then you can learn. And once you know what that is, you'll improve the quality of both exercises and all other exercises that you do. I did this in a video fairly recently where I was talking about how to work the upper back. Now it's like, yeah, upper back, you know, you got rear flies, you got high elbow rows and stuff like that. I'm like, that's great, that's wonderful. But the fact is we wanna be using our upper back in every pulling exercise we ever do. So the real way to work your upper back isn't to do quote upper back exercises, it's to work your upper back and use it with every exercise you do where you're pulling backwards, even pull-ups and verticals and stuff like that. Because once you can do that, the stimulus you create in the muscles is a hell of a lot more powerful and much more consistent. One of the, that's why people ask like, what do you do for calves? Everything everyone else does, but I'm using my calves more when I walk, run, stand still, ride my bike, go skiing. My calves are always working. It's not because I do a special calf routine. It's because I'm working them a lot more all the time. <clears throat> Pedro, when doing pistol squats, is normal uh, going forward too much? Also, I uh, want to know why most of the time I struggle with my balance, my right leg, but I have been practicing many times. Okay, so a couple things here. Uh, one, forward is going to have to happen to some degree for sure, um, just because the leg is in front of you, so you go behind your leg. That's one of the challenges of it. Uh, however, the squatting motion, don't forget that squats should be partially a pulling exercise. So when you go down into a squat, you not only have triple extension when you stand up, but you have triple flexion when you squat down, ankle, knee, and hip. So you wanna feel like you're pulling everything together. And when you don't have enough of that pulling strength, you have to lean forward a lot in order to compensate from falling backwards. So hip and ankle are usually where people falter. It's not in the knee too much, but make sure those hamstrings are really clenching. I mean, you basically wanna feel like you're pressing your glutes into the back of your heel uh, for as much as possible when you're doing that. Uh, stability is also very much in the hips, not, not enough tension in the hips. So it could be glutes and hamstrings, adductors, abductors, hip flexors, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, the, it is the stability is the job of the entire leg naturally, but uh, I would bet money that your hips aren't engaged enough. I'm a big fan of like standing and doing these knee circles. You know, I'm circling my knee. I do this as a stability exercise. It's not about circling the knee. It's about icing up and <clears throat> clenching that hip as tight as possible to improve that, uh, that stability as much as I can. <clears throat> oh, here's a good one here. Dead descent. I've always hated any and all forms of exercise, literally, and still do. That's a good thing to explore for sure because exercise should be enjoyable. It should be something that we get some degree of pleasure from. Now, I was talking the other day about a client and I was uh, basically mentioning like 90% of our success has nothing to do with what we know. It's how we feel about our training and our exercise. And that's very, very different from one from different people because uh, this is there was, was a new client and I wanted to make sure she had a good orientation with the exercise because we were starting to get kind of intense. We we're working more on the tension side of the spectrum. And for people who just didn't grow up with that sort of thing or wasn't, weren't really used to it, it can be a real hard thing to kind of feel positive about. It, it, the alarm bells start going off in the back of the mind. Um, the old phrase that I've always liked is being comfortable being uncomfortable. So like if I go for, when I would do this, <coughs> excuse me, every year bike racing, pardon me, you know, the first bike race, my body would be going to the hilt hard as I can, riding as hard as I possibly can. You know, every race I did was four laps. And if I stopped and thought to myself, 
can I keep this intensity up for all four laps? I'm like, dude, I can't even keep this intensity up for one lap. I knew I'm at the right point. But uh, the first race or two, physically, I would be in agony. But mentally and emotionally, I'd be like, what the hell? Like, this sucks. This sucks. But after a couple of races, physically, still feeling the exact same thing. Like, my body's still going all out. But mentally and emotionally, I'd be like, yeah, okay. This is how it works. This is how we roll. Yep, okay. I'm okay with this. So a lot of times when we dislike an exercise, it's because we feel like something about that isn't right. Now, it could be that something truly isn't right. You know, a lot of times people are like, I hate push-ups. I'm like, let me see your push-up. And they're doing like some sort of, you know, worming monstrosity. I'm like, yeah, I'd hate push-ups if I did them like that too. Rule kind of thing. Exercise is supposed to feel good. It's supposed to make us feel good. It's supposed to be a rewarding experience, even during the experience. Anybody who tells me the best part of this workout is the end, you got a shitty workout. <laughs> That's what that means. Yes, it's going to be challenging, but we want to be emotionally and mentally in a good place to accept that sort of thing. And if not, then we've got some work to do. And don't be an idiot like me back in the day and just assuming that that's how it's supposed to be, that it's supposed to suck, that it's supposed to be bad, that it's supposed to be a miserable experience. That's like, again, making chocolate chip cookies, being like, oh, God, these things taste terrible. Oh, well, but, you know, cookies, you got to eat them. Oh, God, these are horrible. No, you... You can just sit there and be like, this sucks, or be like, well, why does this suck? You know, and someone would be like, you put sugar in there, right? Sure. Where? What? That bin over there. Dude, that's salt. <laughs> that's not sugar. That's salt. No wonder your cookies taste like ass. They're, you put salt in it and not sugar. Figure out why they suck. Figure out why you don't like exercise. Because I'm telling you, on the other side of it is a bright light that is much better, and you're putting yourself through hell for no good reason. You're making it harder than it needs to be. And there's no benefit to making it harder than it needs to be. That's the whole point of like the tr tension triangle is exercise can be hard a million different ways, but many of those ways are a waste of your time. It's not good enough to be hard. It has to be hard for the very specific right reasons for your goals and objectives. And if it's not, it's literally, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You, you're almost better off not even doing it. <clears throat> Alex actually, when I do a dead hang for on a bar for time or on my pull day, I do the neural mass workout. Oh, yes, John Bruni's neural mass workout. Love that workout. Right forearm gives up first. How can I balance my grip strength? Well, the hanging should do it on its own. Um, usually, when you're doing an exercise and you notice there's a weak link in that exercise, uh, it'll just get stronger on its own. It's like when pulling on a chain. It doesn't happen this way, but if you pulled on a chain and the weakest link was like, oh my gosh, and that gets stronger. And then the next weakest, next weakest, next, and then the whole chain gets strong. That's how the muscles work. So that's usually what goes on. Uh, when we get stronger, that should remedy itself within several weeks to a month or so. If that's not the case, I would look at what are you doing differently on your right side? Something's maybe a little out of alignment that's causing the work, the forearm to work harder. So sometimes it could mean the forearm is weaker. It could be though that it's stronger because other things are not doing their job. So I would look at your scapular position. Scap's uh, elevated, obviously with a dead hang, but is it one back? If your left side is packed back more, but your right side is forward, that's gonna cause a little bit of imbalance, probably gonna make that forearm and maybe your, your biceps work harder. Therefore you're giving up uh, a lot quicker. <clears throat> Gloria, what about the control of pelvic tilt when doing push-ups? Yes, I feel that I'm losing control of core stability at the end of every set, two years postpartum and still working on it. Yeah, so a couple of things there, Gloria. Uh, one is just make sure that, you know, your abdominal healing, that your abs are in a good uh, place. I always get the term wrong for this, diastasis, I think, where your abdominals don't fully come back together after pregnancy. Um, so if you've got a gap there, then you've got some of the support from your abdominals just isn't going to be there. It's, it's literally like you're structurally not quite as sound. Uh, but what I would do is practice some uh, strap planks and hollow body planks stretched out. So this is another a good example we were talking about earlier about how strength can maybe improve endurance and vice versa, is let's see if we can get that area a little bit stronger. So stretch out planks, not planks like this, regular stretch out planks, 
And maybe my personal favorite is playing something like gymnastics rings or something less stable, much more challenging to increase the amount of tension there. But the other thing to look at too is your glutes. That pelvic tilt is uh, aided not just by your abs, but your glutes, your hamstrings to a large degree. A lot of people don't keep their glutes tight when they do push-ups. You're expecting just the abs to work, so you've got a two-person team and one person just not in, not doing their part. So the abs are burning out quicker. Uh, so, so I would look at your glutes. So you get your glutes and your abs to turn on. Practice that with your hollow body planks, preferably maybe on some rings to make building up the strength. Because if you can make that more challenging, the pelvic tilt during push-ups should be easier by comparison. <clears throat> Let's see, Samuel is Sigmund. Hey, Matt, I've been stuck on uh, only doing one measly pull-up for several months, and I can't seem to progress. Even with the easier variations, how would you get at a plateau like this? So, uh, I mean, progressing from one to two, I mean, um, percentage-wise, that's huge. So always look at, like, percentages. If you can do 99 reps, getting 100 is a small, tiny progression. But going from one to two is a massive step. It's huge because the amount of strength you need for that is just insane. So what you would do there is just get what you can for that second rep, you know, whatever it is. So you could do your first rep, come down and literally just, uh, good. Okay, that's your second rep. And then you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So just get what you can from that. Maybe do a negative from it and stuff. And again, go back into the regressive repetitions. Okay, so the seated pull-ups kind of thing. And perfect those. Remember, we want to make those things harder. So keeping your shoulder blades back, full range of motion, hardly any assistance whatsoever from the legs. You know, when, when someone tells me, they're like, I could do 30 seated pull-ups, but I can only do one weighted pull-up. I'm like, you're doing something about those seated pull-ups way too easy. Something about it's way too easy because it shouldn't be that big of a gap. So, and, and I'm not saying you're making the regular pull-ups too hard. Something about it's too hard. So usually the range that I find is that the seated pull-ups are like a two to one ratio. So by that logic, if you only get one pull-up, you should only be able to do two seated pull-ups or maybe four. But if you're getting like 20 and like, that's too easy. Uh, we need to make it harder somehow. So put your feet up on an elevated surface, make your legs straight, keep your hips straight down from uh, your torso and so forth. And go back and practice those as well because the way to bridge that gap is to do harder seated pull-ups as well. And that's gonna help you uh, get uh, for, for that sort of thing. So back to our uh, hating uh, exercise. Is it really possible to stop hating exercise for extreme cases like me? I hope so. <laughs> that is the million dollar question. So let me tell you a story about a friend of mine. Well, not a friend of mine, but a client one time. Every time I would work out with her, she would she would complain about it. She, I would just be like, okay, let's warm up arm circles. And she'd be like, oh, you know, it's like pulling teeth. Every the lo smallest thing she would do. And finally, after a few weeks of this, I just went out on a limb and I was like, you're never an athlete, were you? Because this is the thing. Whenever I train athletes, they get it. They know what it's like to push themselves. They're comfortable with it. They enjoy the process. Hundred time, uh, Most of the time, they're 100% in. I say jump, they say how high. But people who didn't grow up being physically active, they're just, ugh. It's much harder for them to understand what it's like because they didn't grow up with it. Uh, for me, I grew up in the mountains of Vermont, skiing, biking, hiking, climbing trees, throwing snowballs, all that sort of thing. So for me, being sedentary is really weird, like because it's not how I usually how I grew up. But someone who grew up being sedentary and then they're in their fifties and they're like, okay, time to go for a run. It's like really strange. So that was her case. She not only did she not grow up being athletic, but she's like, oh God, no, I'd never play sports in school. I didn't want to be like any of those. And she just went on this tirade of how she hated athletes. She was uh, always making fun of the jocks. You know, if her girlfriend started dating some guy who was into sports, she would like be talking behind her, like that guy's such an asshole. You should break up with him. She had this emotional seated loathing for athletics. So anytime she was like, okay, time to get into some exercise. I want to get in shape. Her emotional state around athletics was this sucks. You're becoming one of those people you hate. And she would 
shoot self-sabotage every single time. So that's always where we want to start is when we have a negative emotional orientation, it's either to the, to the method or to the, um, to the objective that we're doing. Now, if it's the method, that's easy. It's like, I hate running. Well, don't run then ride a bike, climb stairs, swing kettlebells, do anything else. Because if it's the method, then just doing a different method should feel better, right? I hate this diet. Well, then just a different diet should alleviate the problem. But when you do one thing after another and they all feel the same, it's not the exercise. There's something about the process that we have a negative orientation to. And that's something to do some deep introspection of why do you have a negative orientation to that thing? And then we find this a lot in the the self-help industry and stuff. What's, why do you have a negative orientation to money? Why do you have a negative orientation to marriage or relationships and all these sorts of things? Because if our deep subconscious feelings and beliefs about something are negative, you're never going to let yourself do things. And yeah, you can force it. You can go on robot mode once in a while and you can do it for, but let's, let's be honest. I mean, that's like going into the repair shop with your car and putting on square wheels. Like, yeah, you can kind of do it, but no. It's not going to work. It's not going to end well. There's no happy ending at the end of this one. The results won't be worth it. It's it's not good. We want to get to a better place emotionally. And the other thing too is it could just be what we think exercise is. This is um, uh, something I'm going to be doing a video on where we think it's supposed to be misery. We think it's supposed to be a bad thing. And as a result, we make it hard on ourselves because that's how we think it's supposed to be. And I hear this all the time. People are like, I'd love to get in shape, but I hate exercise. I hate dieting and stuff. The bottom line is diet and exercise should be an enjoyable process. It should improve the quality of your life, full stop. If it's not improving your quality of life, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Something about it is bad. Something about the application is bad. We need to find a better way for you to be doing it so that it's at least a little bit more enjoyable. And if it's not, you're off, you're off on some way. Uh, it's uh, one sort of thing that is just not going to work for you. <clears throat> Continuing the conversation, no matter how much you work out, you won't build muscle anyway because, uh, excuse me. So don't get too caught up in hormones. Everybody's on hormones these days. Hormones, this hormones. I couldn't give a fuck about hormones. I don't do anything about hormones. I don't care at all about what my testosterone level is. We're getting way too tweaked out about it. And the reason is because uh, your endocrine system is a hell of a lot more complicated than if you eat this or you do this kind of training, this is what happens to your hormones. It's not even close to that simple. Not even close. Uh, back in the day, people used to think if you exercise this way, you do this to your hormones, therefore you get these results. You eat this way, you do this to your hormones, you get these results. It's not, that's a way oversimplified way to go about it. Not at all in the least bit true. But it's not to say hormones aren't important. I'm just saying how we address these things is way off. Uh, the way we want to look at it is, again, this is to the point. Things that are enjoyable and make you feel good are typically associated with a stronger hormonal response. So you could kind of link it to if it's hard and chronically stressful, it's killing your hormone levels. So lack of sleep, crappy restrictive dieting practices exhaustive exercise practices, things that break you down chronically are not going to be pretty good for your hormone levels. Because one of the things that we want to recognize is in fitness, we're trying to build ourselves up, not try to fix ourselves from chronic stress. So this is one of the big mistakes of we've got to make ourselves miserable, shoots ourselves in the foot. If your diet is so restrictive, you're always hungry and craving and you're miserable, then you're basically using all of your resources to just get through the process. Same thing with exercise. If you're just beating the hell out of yourself and you're always sore, you're always tired, you're always exhausted, then you are using your resources just to heal yourself and get back to baseline. You can't build yourself up. So the analogy, another car analogy I use with this is imagine if you had like a sports car and you're like, dude, I'm going to soup this sucker up. I'm going to get some faster wheels and some performance chip and more horsepower, and I'm going to make it awesome and great and wonderful. But on the way to the tuning shop, you smashed into a telephone pole and then you limped it to the shop and they're like, well, we were going to spend a month working on your car and all this money fixing up, but now we got to do it just to get it back to where it was. 
you know, we can't build you to be better. We have to just get you to be reasonably healthy. It's like, all right, we'll do that. And then as soon as you do that again, bang, you rang into a semi truck. And you're like, you're always beating up this car. We can't fix, we can't make it better because we're always fixing it. You don't want to be beating up your body all the time because you can't get stronger if you're always beating yourself up. It's the same thing with diet. If you're always restricting yourself and you're always hungry and you're always, diet shouldn't be hard. <laughs> It shouldn't be stressful. A good diet removes stress from the body. It doesn't add to it. If your diet is making you stressed out mentally or physically, you have a shitty diet. <laughs> God, I wish I knew that back in the day. I would have really, really, really um, uh, saved myself a lot of problems because I thought stress is what changes the body. Stress is not what changes the body. Stress is what breaks down the body. It's education. So you're talking about walking. Absolutely. I think walking is one of the best things that can be done to help remove stress, uh, both um, uh, the, uh, the, the things. So you're asking, what if I regularly binge huge amounts of junk food like me, though? So the binging, so binging and purging are linked, inherently linked. Binging is a sign of stress. So we binge to remove one stress while building on another. So this is where these cycles come from. So it we want to be mindful that every action equal and opposite reaction, right? So one of the big things that happens is people are like, I'm super clean and I'm doing a meeting very little and stuff like that. And that's causing stress because now you're depriving your body. You're not feeding yourself adequately. And then you binge and that's a different kind of stress. You're relieving one kind of stress to bring on another kind of stress. It's kind of like you exhaust yourself with exercise for two weeks and then you sit on the couch for two weeks. So exhausting yourself with chronic stressful physical activity is stressful in one way, and then sitting on the couch and doing nothing for two weeks is stressful in another way. And this is how this cycle happens. You're always under stress, and your body can never get on a solid ground, good footing kind of thing. And usually it's taking more of a, quote, boring, moderate approach with diet and exercise. The best approaches, the best habits are the ones that are the easiest to maintain. You know, I can only do 10 push-ups a day. Exactly. You know, my 3P strategy, plant protein and portion at every meal, moderation, moderate food portions, never really getting hungry, never really getting too uh, satisfied kind of thing. The best habits for most people when it comes to diet are boring and they don't look like anything. They don't feel like they're going to do anything. They don't feel like they're going to make anything happen because there's something you can get in the middle of the road with, and then you move it to side a little bit. So binging is a sign of the um, well, purging or restriction. So chronic restriction, chronic binging. So when we have one, we wanna look at the other, right? You, the idea, you don't wanna stop binging. You can't stop binging. It's like, I gotta not binge. Well, that doesn't work. That's like relying on willpower. If, you, if that was the case, then you would already do that. So we want to be cutting back on what's fueling those binges, the restriction. You know, restriction diet, that's, that's the biggest uh, myth in our fitness culture is, um, uh, you know, our, our, most of our dietary approaches out there are based on restriction and deprivation, which is completely the back, backwards way to approach a healthy diet because that's how we stress our body out is restriction. So I don't restrict my diet in any way, shape or form. I eat anything I want. I eat as much as I want and I eat it whenever the hell I want. I plowed through most of a pint of ice cream last night. No problem. Is that a binge? Absolutely not. My body can handle it easily. That's not junk food. I'm using it. It's good for me, you know, because I can use it. So that's not a binge. That's like, dude, I want this ice cream. I'm eating it kind of thing. I don't restrict. I feed. I feed and I fuel my body and it loves me for it. And as a result, I haven't had any binges or restrictions God knows how long. It's uh, one of those, it's just one of the approaches to healthy dieting that we have healthy eating here at the Red Delta Project. It's completely in opposition to most of the other dietary approaches, which are, like I said, just going in completely the wrong direction. But anyway, I'm getting way off topic here. It has already been well over an hour. Thank you very much, folks, for coming on in. I will be discussing more in uh, the uh, near future, but as always, if you have topic requests, DM me. Uh, Red Delta Project on Instagram, or you can just reach out to me in email, Red Delta Project at gmail.com. And uh, you can ask me questions there further as well. But thank you very much for watching. Folks, don't forget to check out the full list 
RDP library down below uh, to help support the channel here. And I've got tons more books coming out. So make sure you get read up on those so you understand some of the sequels coming out, like the sequel to Fitness Independence and so on, and Grind Style Calisthenics, which will be further books in the future as well. So thanks very much for coming on, folks. I'll talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live free.